Hi everyone, my name is Steve Loftus and today on a special episode of Behind the Wings we're going to take a close-up look at a Second World War super bomber, the amazing B-29 Super Fortress. This is part two of our series on the B-29 Super Fortress. If you'd like to come along for a flight, go and check out part one. Now let's get into it. Just look at this thing, it's amazing, it's remarkable and it's enormous. This one's going to be super cool. Let's take a walk around the aeroplane and uh, take a closer look. So it's time now to really get into this thing. Let's figure out some of the history, some of the development history, and maybe a little bit about the aircraft design and also a little bit about mission history. Frank, it's great to be here with you today. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and this remarkable piece of engineering. I'm Franklin Berry. I'm uh, our historian. I'm also one of our crew members and one of our maintainers on the airplane. And today we're going to show you a little bit about some of the special features that made a B-29 unique and so special for World War II. The Army Air Corps clearly had a very specific mission in mind for the B-29 Super Fortress. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the history and how they came up with this design. Okay, well in uh, 1936 or thereabouts, the B-17 came out. The B-24 was soon to follow. They had about an eight to 10,000 pound payload and a maximum range of 2,000 miles but they couldn't do them together. So if they were gonna go full range, they had to carry less payload. By uh, 1940, uh, the war in Europe was getting pretty, pretty deep and it became apparent to uh, most of the army commanders that there was some real concerns as to whether England was gonna survive and we were gonna need a long range heavy bomber. January of 1940, the specs came out for a request for a heavy bomber that could go 4,000 miles and carry 20,000 pounds of payload. So that's where the B-29 got its initial design development. Five companies put forth initial bids. Boeing and Consolidated were the only ones who ended up building any kind of a prototype. Boeing's design far exceeded all the other uh, initial offerings, and so it was clearly the early front runner. Uh, it incorporated things like pressurization for comfort for the long range flights, uh, flush riveting for uh, low drag, higher speed. It was capable of carrying a 20,000 pound payload uh, and a 4,000 mile range. And it could cruise at 367 miles an hour top speed, which was 100 to 150 miles an hour faster than its predecessors. It also incorporated a central fire control system, completely remote controlled gunnery system. Nobody touched a gun on a B-29. Uh, five remote gun sites that fed information to one of five parallax computers. The first use of portable electronic computers in the world were on a B-29. Five vacuum tube clockwork mechanism computers made all the calculations to put the bullets in the enemy aircraft at the same point in space. Considered 10 times more accurate than hand shooting, about 80% accurate at 1,000 yards, above 90% at 800 yards, and the Japanese bullets couldn't even reach us till 750 yards. So this became an airplane you didn't want to tangle with in a, in a uh, dogfight. So you were going to lose that equation. <laughs> so Frank, the, uh, the B-29 was clearly a very advanced aircraft for its time. You've mentioned a few of those innovations. Perhaps we could take a little closer look at some of those definite technology advancements. Sure, let's go this way. So Frank, you mentioned the pressurized system on the aircraft. What was the real point of that? Um, the pressurization basically allowed the uh, crew to remain in a lot more comfort for the 14-hour missions that they typically flew. Longest mission was 18 hours, so if you can imagine being at minus 20, minus 30 degrees in Europe for, for 18 hours, you weren't going to be any good as a crewman. Whereas if you were in a heated and a pressurized compartment, just like an airliner, you were going to be much more relaxed and a lot more comfortable at the end of the mission than you would otherwise. Thanks, Frank, that's fascinating. So maybe we can go inside the cockpit and take a closer look. Absolutely, let's go. Just duck your head and then watch your head inside because we've got a A-frame structure for the nose gear doors. So wow, I can't believe I'm sitting in the cockpit of a B-29 right now. This is like a dream come true. It's like an eight-year-old uh, dream come true right here. So uh, Frank, please do tell us, what, what are we actually looking at in here? Well, I'm sitting in the pilot seat, and of course you're sitting in the co-pilot seat. Various flight controls here, throttles, 
to our outsides, Bombay autopilot controls, emergency brakes here in the center console. You're standing in the bombardier's position. Facing forward, he would look through the Norden bomb site direct, directly in front of him. Uh, and then in combat, he would take the gun sight to his right and he would unlock that, swing that around in front of him and uh, sight on the enemy aircraft from there. And then the rest of the three crewmen in the, in the front were behind us. Navigator, flight engineer, and radio operator. So Frank, the Norden bomb site was affectionately known as the football by the bombardiers. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about it. What makes it so special? The Norden bomb site was the most um, accurate optical bomb site ever developed. Never bettered as an optical bomb site. Switches on. EDI switch on. Servo on. Bomb site switch on. So uh, in theory, it could hit a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet under optimal conditions. The Air Force used it up through 1974 when they replaced it with uh, laser-guided bombs. So it was considered a pretty state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line object for, for many, many years and decades. Unfortunately, once uh, we got over Japan, we discovered a phenomenon that we did not have to deal with in Europe, and that was uh, jet stream winds. Up to three jet stream winds converge over the islands of Japan with winds above 100 miles an hour. And so between the altitudes that the bombers were flying at and the ground were converging winds that literally would take the bombs and blow them off course. First attack on the Yawada steel mill, they aimed at Japan and hit the Pacific Ocean. One bomb from 148 airplanes actually hit the ground and the remaining hit the water. So the bomb site was a very accurate bomb site, but could not take into account winds between the altitudes of the bomber and the ground. And then by the spring of 45, LeMay had determined that uh, the Japanese industry was really fed by the cottage industry of everybody at home building something for the war effort. And the simplest way to destroy their war making capacity was to literally burn cities to the ground. And so incendiary bombs are worthless from high altitude. They really need to be dropped from lower altitude. So he went to night bombing down to 18 to 15,000 feet and created the fire bombing raids that we know of today that destroyed 70% uh, of every major industrial city in Japan in about a three month period. This is the flight engineer's position. He manages all the systems on the aircraft. We jokingly say he's got 40 gauges and 50 switches, and that's not too far wrong. All of the gauges are dual needles, so they control two engines uh, for each gauge. So uh, as you can see, it's uh, quite extensive. He manages the fuel, the electricity, the power from the engines, uh, the hydraulics, which are for the brakes, pressurization, um, fuel transfer, de-ice. Everything was managed from this position here coordinated through the pilot and co-pilot by, by the intercom. So the aircraft was pressurized, but only certain segments of the aircraft were actually pressurized. The cockpit segment, the gunnery segment connected through the tunnel, and the tail gunner's position were pressurized. The bomb bays were not, so they were sealed off with pressure bulkheads. They typically flew uh, all their high altitude stuff, anything above 8,000 feet, they flew pressurized. But they would actually unpressurized for combat. That way, any battle damage incurred would not be nearly as catastrophic. And then after combat, uh, and they left the area, they would repressurize, assuming they didn't have too much battle damage. So the flight engineer basically controlled every system in the airplane, so, uh, and from this station. So if it had to be done, this is who did it. So Frank, thanks for that information about the main cockpit. We've stepped back behind the main cockpit. What are we looking at here? Uh, this would be the aft section of the main cockpit. We have the navigator seat over here. Uh, he would obviously do all of his plotting for his long-range navigation. Uh, you're, sit you're standing at the radio operator's position. He had access to all of the radios and controlled all of the communication functions. Air-to-air -air by voice, air-to-ground voice, and then long-range air-to-ground by Morse code. And it was also coded. So he had a code book he had to translate from as well. The pressure door into the bomb bay is down below, and then the ladder accesses the tunnel to access the aft 
gunner's compartment. There was a chemical toilet back there, a hot box galley stove for a hot meal, a couple of bunks for a, a rest period if you wanted, uh, but you all had to crawl through the tunnel. But with average missions 12 to 14 hours long, uh, you were spending a half a day or more in the air in a B-29. Yep, that's a long day in the office. It is. So Frank, one of the unique uh, innovations on the B-29 was the fast cycling bomb bay doors. Perhaps you could tell us a little more about that and why they came about. Yeah, let's take a look. We can head on into this forward bomb bay. Sounds good. So Frank, tell me a little bit more about what we're looking at here. So this is the forward bomb bay. There were two separated by the mid midsection of the wing. These were air operated, so they opened in about one second and closed in about a second and a half. That way the aircraft could keep up its maximum speed, stay streamlined till the last second, pop the doors open, release all the ordnance, and close the doors and get clean and get out of Dodge real quick. And how did that compare with the, um, the experiences of the B-17 uh, bombers? Compared to the B-17, it's about a, a seven second bomb bay door opening sequence. So, uh, and a lot more drag, so the airplane's running slower and decelerating with the doors open. Uh, so it gives the fighters a chance to come in and try to attack. Okay, so it's a huge space we're looking at here. Could you tell us a little bit more about the, the actual bomb load capacity of one of these aircraft? So each bomb bay could carry 10,000 pounds. So on these green racks, these are the bomb racks, there would be three to five racks down each side carrying a variety of ordnance. We have an example of a 1,000 pounder, a 500 pounder, and a 250 pounder so uh, people can get an idea of the standard ordinance that was pretty much carried by B-29s. Is it true that General LeMay asked for the guns to be stripped out of some of these aircraft so they could carry heavier bomb loads? So by the spring of 45, uh, when LeMay was going from high altitude daylight bombing to uh, medium altitude nighttime bombing, uh, he did request that the guns be removed so that uh, they could carry more fuel and more ordnance. The bomber crews were not happy because they were happy with the gunnery system. Uh, so they often taped broomsticks to the airplane so the enemies would think that they still had guns. But the Japanese had learned to stay away from the B-29s. They knew they were a deadly adversary. And so uh, for the most part they shadowed the bomber fleets in and out of Japan and didn't come in and attack at that point. Uh, and never did figure out that we'd remove the guns from the airplanes. Frank, this has been really interesting talking about the bomb bay, but one of the things that fascinates me about this airplane are the undercarriage, the dual wheel situation. Can we take a look at that and talk about it? Yeah, let's go look at that. Awesome. The aircraft was basically twice the weight of a B-17. So rather than in invent a, a new wheel brake tire system, they just doubled them up. So it is the same wheel, brake, and tire assembly on a B-17, just use two of them. So uh, B-29s did have to operate out of improved fields, so they didn't operate off of grass either concrete, asphalt, or crushed coral, uh, whereas the B-17s were light enough to operate off of grass fields like in England. Frank, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate your help today, taking us around the aeroplane. We've learned a lot. If you missed part one of this series about the B-29 Superfortress, go check that out for some more history about this remarkable aeroplane, including right here at Lowry Air Force Base. So come join us at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. And as only 6% of you have actually subscribed to our YouTube channel, subscribe already. Now I've got some other airplanes to look at. <laughs>